before. Some of you may have not. There is a real benefit to using parametric curves. The idea is that we want to come up with another way to represent curves, uh, both functions and relations. Remember, a relation is a curve that doesn't pass the vertical line test. Uh, and let me ask you a simple question. Let's see, what pen am I supposed to use on this board that is definitely not going to crash today? Uh, let me ask you a simple question. Let's suppose we're thinking about curves. If we're thinking about curves, most of the curves that we've graphed are in two-dimensional space. Uh, maybe you've done some graphing of curves in three-dimensional space in science or somewhere, like a helix, or maybe just a trajectory in three-dimensional space, something. But let's just imagine a curve in three-dimensional space. Question is, can we represent a curve in three-dimensional space with a Cartesian equation? So we know that in general, in two-dimensional space, if we write ax plus by equals c, that's going to represent a curve in two-dimensional space. Right? That's just, uh, just going to be a line in two-dimensional space. All right? So let's go with the simplest possible concept in three dimensions. Let's just go with a line first. How could we possibly represent a line in three-dimensional space? Any ideas? Wait, what's all that mumbling? Just mumbling? I was going to say, I don't know, maybe like x plus dy plus cz or something. So, and that is a very natural thing to say that Maybe we, if it's going to be a line in three-dimensional space, it has to be linear, right? So we can't have any squares or anything. This would be the simplest possible linear equation in three-dimensional space. That's the simplest possible linear equation in three space. So if there is going to be a Cartesian equation for a line in three space, that seems like the candidate. But you already know what the graph of this is. You should have done it in college algebra and pre-calculus. What is the graph of this? Like for example, if you graph, let's, let's pick a specific. If you graph x plus y minus 2z equals 1, what is that graph? It is a... What is it? It's a plane, right? A plane. This is a plane. That's a, those are the sounds of a plane. <laughs> Believe it or not. I haven't flown a while. So that is, the simplest possible equation is a plane in three-dimensional space. So that means we are SOL. We are out of luck. There's no Cartesian, no standard Cartesian equation for a line in three-dimensional space. If the only, if the simplest possible linear equation generates a plane, that's too many dimensions. A line is just one dimensional. So that is all the motivation we need for coming up with another way to graph curves. If the simplest curve in three space cannot be represented with a Cartesian equation, we need another way. Because we live in three dimensions, and everything you throw in the air, everything that's floating around in the air, is a curve in three dimensional space. So we need to be able to represent those curves in three space. And that's what parametric equations are for. That's the, there's one good thing about parametric equations, is that they allow us to represent curves in three dimensional space. So there's our motivation. Now, a really nice thing about parametric equations is that not only can we create curves in three space, we can create direction. Like if we were to graph a circle, x squared plus y squared equals one, just a unit circle, there's really not a starting point and an ending point and really a direction. Right? You, there's just a splattering of points all of a sudden. It's not like they're graphed one point at a time when you're doing a Cartesian. You know, you pick a few points and you connect the dots. With 
parametric curves, we are also going to get an orientation, which is really nice. So if we think about most of the things we deal with in math and science, we think of trajectories. We launch a rocket, we want to know the path that it takes and where it is at time t. And if two rockets are going to collide, we want to know where are they at time t and will, they, will their paths cross or will they intersect? You know, at the same moment, will they collide? So there's all those kind of things. Just because the paths cross doesn't mean the objects are going to collide. They would have to cross at the same moment, right? So all these things become really easy or easier to analyze with parametric curves because we do have a path per moment in time that they are going to trace out. So that, those are all great things. So the question then becomes, what do parametric equations look like and how do we graph them? So here is a set of parametric equations. And the idea is that we create an equation for each of the coordinates. So if we're in two-dimensional space, you're going to have an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. They're going to be functions of t. t is going to be the parameter. We pick t because it kind of represents time, because that's mostly what we'll do in the real world. And the cool, or one of the cool things is that if we go into three dimensions, all we have to do is have another coordinate. We have a z. For example, if I tell you to graph this equation, you should say there, there's not enough information. You don't know what the graph of that looks like. If the question says graph this in, in the real numbers, then you're graphing a point on a line. If it says graph this in two-dimensional space, in R2, then you're graphing a vertical line right there. If you're in three-dimensional space, so if you're in R3, the graph of x equals 1 is going to be a plane at x equals 1. This is usually considered the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. So we're one unit out. So if you have a Cartesian equation, you actually don't know what the space, we usually call it the ambient space, the space in which the equation lives or the graph lives, you need to know more than just the equation. With parametric, it's all built in. We know this is in two-dimensional space because there's two equations. For three dimensions, there would be a third equation. We also know whether it's a line or a surface. A line is a one-dimensional object, or a curve is a one-dimensional object, and there's one parameter. If you wanted to graph a surface, which you'll do in Calc 3 parametrically, you will do it with two parameters. Usually they'll use an S and a T, or a U and a V. Um, so you could have a, so if you have an X, a Y, and a Z, that's three space, and if you had two parameters, that would be a surface in three space. <laughs> So parametric equations also are really revealing of what's happening. Uh, there's no mystery, you know, you're not trying to guess uh, what's happening. Okay, so the, uh, let's look at an example here. So here are the steps. So we've got this set of parametric equations, which are going to build a parametric curve. In order to build that curve, first we build a Cartesian curve. And the parametric curve is going to be a subset of the Cartesian curve. It might be the entire Cartesian curve, but it could only be part of it. So if you look right here, we see that we have a restriction on the t values. And so that tells us that we're going to end up getting perhaps just a portion of the Cartesian curve, not the whole thing, possibly. So let's check. So what we're going to do first, eliminate the t, graph the Cartesian with dashes or dots, and then look at the parametric domain, and then pick the, you know, pick the part of the curve that corresponds with the par parametric domain, and then uh, indicate the orientation. So orientation is always the direction of increasing t. So this is the direction of increasing t. So it's the direction the points are plotted tells us the direction the points are plotted. All right, so let's go ahead and first step one, let's eliminate the t. Well, the parametric curve is a, oh wait, that's not what I wanted to show. I wanted to show, uh, let's see, get rid of that. I wanted to show, can I do that? Um, Pythagorean identities may be helpful. 
to eliminate T. So if we see trig functions there to eliminate the T, like you've done this a million times in algebra where you solve for one letter and plug it into the other, it's called the substitution technique. Well, with trig functions, it's a little different. You can't solve that for T effectively. You, know, you, can't, you don't want to solve this and say, oh, T is inverse cosine of X. That's not, what, that's not the move. We want to use this fact. So we know that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. And we want to use this fact. So this is an identity, which means that equation is true for every single replacement of the variable. That doesn't cause something to be undefined. Sine and cosine are never undefined, so it's no issue here. But, so an identity is true for all replacements of the variable. It's always true. So we look up here. Y is sine of t. So this, when we do our substitution here, we end up with this equation right there. Oh, that's a unit circle. Cartesian equation, unit circle. So now, next step, once we've got our Cartesian curve, now we need to figure out, well, what part of it is the parametric curve? Is the parametric curve the whole thing? Part of it? Who knows? Let's try. <clears throat> so usually, to do that, we start picking values here. So we're going to pick a t value, and then we're going to get the corresponding ordered pair. So let's see. Well, our t starts at 0 and ends at pi, so we certainly want those to be in our table. And then we usually need to pick one extra point in the middle. If you have a closed curve, like a circle, and you pick two points, there's no way to tell whether you want to cross the top or around the bottom. So we need a third point to figure out, well, which way are we going? So we're going to pick something in between. It does not have to be halfway in between, but it's usually what we do. 0 pi over 2 and pi. So we come up to our parametric curve, plug in t equals 0. When t is 0, cosine of 0 is 1, sine of 0 is 0. So we are right here. This is the point that we are starting at. That is corresponding to t equals 0. So t equals 0 corresponds to the point 1 comma 0. And this should look like unit circle stuff, right? We say cosine is the x direction, sine is the y direction. So this is going to graph the unit circle counterclockwise orientation. We're going to come across the top. So pi over 2, plug that in. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. So we get 0 comma 1. So we are right here when t is equal to pi over 2. And we start to see that with this parametric curve, the parameter t plays a very obvious geometric role. Counterclockwise angle, right? In, in many parametric curves, the, ang the, uh, par the, the angle here may not have a geometric correspondence that's useful. A lot of times it does, but in some cases it just doesn't. Here it does. Here the, par the parameter represents the angle, counterclockwise rotation, so that's convenient. Plug in pi, cosine pi negative 1, sine pi 0, so we're at negative 1 comma 0. So this is where we are at when we plug in pi. So this tells us two things. This tells us that our curve is the top half, top half of the unit circle. So there is our parametric curve. <coughs> it also tells us the orientation. We started at t being 0. The next value was up here. The next value is over here. So we usually will draw arrows to represent the orientation. And the arrows that we're going to draw will be this way. We don't put them at the endpoints, though, uh, because then that could be confusing. You could be implying that the curve continues. This curve does not continue. It starts and it stops. So that is our parametric curve. So it's a subset of the unit circle, counterclockwise orientation. Very convenient. And you start to see how these trig functions correspond to different circles or ellipses, perhaps. All right, so here are a couple other ones. These are going to have the same exact uh, Cartesian curve. All right, so we know that sine squared <coughs> plus cosine squared is 1. It doesn't matter whether it's a t or a negative t. If you have the, as long as this angle matches, we know that that's true. 
right? If the angles are the same, sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, always. Well, sine squared, where sine is equal to y, this gives us the same exact equation. There it is. So, same Cartesian curve. Let's check the points and the orientation and all that stuff. So now we're going to plug in some t values, and those are going to generate ordered pairs. And once again, we're going 0 to pi, so let's pick a 0 and a pi for sure, and something in between, the natural choice is pi over 2. So now we're going to check the ordered pairs. Plug in 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. Sine of 0 is 0. Okay, so we are right here. That is the initial point. So same starting point. Let's see what the orientation is. Plugging in pi over 2, we get cosine of negative pi over 2, which is 0. Sine of negative pi over 2 is negative 1. So now we're going this way. Plug in pi. Cosine of negative pi is negative 1. Sine of negative pi is 0. So we end up here. That's t equals pi. So here is our Cartesian curve, excuse me, our parametric curve. And the orientation is that way. So now we have the lower half of the circle, and the orientation is clockwise, not counterclockwise. Now it may be very tempting to say that if you turn t into minus t, it just reverses the orientation. It's not always the case. It's one candidate if you want to change orientation. Reversing t to negative t sometimes will reverse the orientation. Not always, though, but that's one possibility. Now let's take a look and see what happens when we interchange the sine and the cosine. So if we interchange the sine and the cosine, so now x is sine and y is cosine. Okay, so standard unit circle is cosine comma sine. Now we're going to do sine comma cosine. Let's see what happens. Okay, same idea though uh, with the, with the, with the uh, Cartesian curve. We know that sine squared of t plus cosine squared of t is 1. So this is going to give us x squared plus y squared is equal to 1, which is the unit circle. Now let's see where we start, where we stop, and what the orientation is. So we're going to come over and plug in some points. So we say, okay, well, we're going to plug in t values. We're going to generate ordered pairs. So let's see, plugging in t equals, again, we're going 0 to pi. So we're going to pick these. These are the natural choices for the parameter. Plug in 0. Sine of 0 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So now our initial point, t equals 0, is up here on top. So we're starting at, at noon, up there. Okay, plug in pi over 2. So we come to each coordinate equation. Sine of pi over 2, oh, that's 0. Uh, no, sine of pi over 2 is 1, thank you. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. So that's going to be a 1. Cosine of pi over 2, when we plug in pi over 2 there, cosine of pi over 2, that is 0. So we're at the point 1, 0, so we're right here. So there's t equals pi over 2. All right, well, we see what's happening. We're going to get the right half of the circle with clockwise orientation. Plug in pi, sine of pi is 0, cosine of pi is negative 1. So we're down here at 0, negative 1. This is t equals pi. Here is our parametric curve, and the orientation is clockwise. <clears throat> so we saw we replaced t with negative t in a change of the orientation. We switched the x and the y and that changed the orientation. Those are two things that to try. If your whole goal is to change the orientation, those are two candidates. Try switching the order, try changing t to minus t. There's no one thing that always works. 
So any questions so far on the concepts of a parametric curve? And is it pretty clear that in all three of these examples, if we went from 0 to 2 pi, we'd have a full circle? And so we have to be a little careful because sometimes um, there's going to be overlap. If we went 0 to 4 pi, we would trace out the circle twice. And if a question said, what is the arc length? If we literally wanted the arc length of what we see, we would want to parameterize it so that we trace out the curve exactly once. So we have to be a little bit careful when we're thinking about things like that. Because uh, you can't trace over yourself. Okay. So Desmos is a great uh, application for um, practicing this stuff and playing around with parametric curves. It's super easy. So I've got some here. Here is the standard circle. I put in a t and I have a, here I say t is going to go 0 to 2 pi. And I'm doing it with a slider so you can see here that we're starting uh, right there at 1 comma 0 and we're going to go counterclockwise. So you can play around with this one, you can create your own, pretty easy. So this one, we replace the t with negative t, we're going to go clockwise and we're going to get one full circle if we go 0 to 2 pi. So these are the three that we did already, and then here is an oddball one. So here we replace t with pi minus t, let's see what it does. So at zero we're right there, so we're on the left side of the unit circle. So we kind of shifted our start point by pi, and we are going clockwise. So we're going to get one full pass if we go zero to two pi. Um, so playing around in Desmos is a good way to kind of just sort of see what's happening with these parametric curves. And it's nice in Desmos because you can see the orientation. You can see what direction the points are plotted pretty easily. So let's try some non-trig ones. Let's try some non-trig ones and notice a couple of other features. So with the trig ones, we notice that the domain, that parametric domain, uh, was sort of dictating the points that were on the Cartesian curve, right? That really specifically told us what we include and what we don't include. So let's check this stuff out here. So, no trig functions. Same process, though. Step one, eliminate t. Okay, well, that, that's pretty easy here. When we eliminate t, we get y equals x squared, right? We've isolated t up here to be equal to x, so we're going to replace that t with an x. There is our Cartesian curve. Our Cartesian curve is the standard parabola. <coughs> now, this has a t interval from negative 2 to 2, so let's go ahead and figure out what our subset is. So we definitely are going to start at negative 2, and we're definitely going to end at 2. Now, this is not a closed curve. It's not a closed curve. So two points is going to be enough. But just for good measure, we'll plug in a third point just to be safe. So plugging in negative 2 for t, that puts us at negative 2 comma 4. So negative 2 comma 4, there is t equals negative 2. <clears throat> Plug in 0, we get the origin. So you can see that the... Um, you can see that the t interval, it doesn't have to start at zero. You can let the t interval be whatever you want it to be. So origin right there, that's where t is equal to zero. And then t equals two, we're going to be at two comma four. So we'll be up here, there's t equals two. So this tells us that, okay, the parametric curve is going to, going to look like this. There will be our parametric curve and the orientation, the direction of increasing t is that way. So there's our parametric curve. Yeah. So this is a function. This is a function. Remember our concept of a function. With parametric curves, it is not based on visually what you see anymore. 
These circles are parametric functions. Because a function says you have a unique output for each input. So for each of these t values between 0 and pi, we have one exact point that it's corresponding to on the graph. So that is a parametric function, even though it's not a Cartesian function. Right? There's only one ordered pair for each value of t that you plug in. You're not plugging in a t and then getting this or that. You're getting a specific one unique point. So these are functions. Now when you look at this, you can say, oh yeah, that's a Cartesian function. But looks can be deceiving with parametric curves. So let's uh, continue. So how about this one? Okay, same Cartesian curve, right? X is equal to t squared. So if we come down here, oh, t to the fourth is t squared squared. So we have that x is equal, uh, we have that y is equal to x squared. So same exact Cartesian curve. But let's go ahead and look at our points now. So same interval, negative 2 to 2. So we're going to have our t values. They're going to correspond to ordered pairs. We're going to plug in, let's go with three points again. So plugging in negative 2 gives us 2 comma 6, no, it gives us 4 comma 16. 0 gives us the origin. And then what does positive 2 give us? It also gives us 4 comma 16. Okay, so a little different, a little different. So negative 2 is 4 comma 16, so that's going to be right here. There's t equals negative 2. t equals 0 is going to be down here. But then t equals, oh, I should have started at negative 2. So both negative 2 and positive 2 give us the same point. So our parametric curve here is this portion of the parabola right there. Is it orientable? It's not orientable because it comes down and bounces off the origin and goes back. So it's not orientable. If the interval went from negative 2 to 0, we would say the orientation is down, and if the interval went from 0 to 2, we would say the orientation is up, but it's not going to be orientable. What do you mean when you say it's orientable or not orientable? So when we look at this curve, are the points plotted in one direction? So up here, with the other one, the points are plotted in this direction. So the physical curve that we say, we can say, we can put these arrows and say, the points are plotted, this is the direction of increasing t. But down here, that's not going to be possible because we have that hidden cusp. Like if you looked at that Cartesian curve, you would say, oh, that's differentiable. Wouldn't you say that's differentiable? There's no corners, there's no cusps, there's nothing funny. It's smooth. A smooth curve is differentiable. But that Cartesian curve is different from the parametric curve. The parametric curve actually has a cusp. All right? Because the plotting of the points comes down here, and then it stops, and then it goes back. So this is not going to be a, you know, a differentiable Cartesian curve. So when you get into um, looking at the calculus of parametric curves, there's some of these weird subtleties. When we get to arc length here, if we want the length of that arc, we want to choose negative 2 to 0 or 0 to 2. If we went negative 2 to positive 2, we'd get too much. Right? The arc length will be determined by a single pass of this curve. So we cannot orient this as is. We would have to change the domain. So as it stands, that's not orientable. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about a sideways parabola. So here we have our parametric curve. So we've got our two components, our two coordinate functions right there. And then we have the domain. So the Cartesian curve is this parabola right over here. 
Um, let's first make sure that we understand how to get that equation, that Cartesian equation. So we want to eliminate the T here and come up with our Cartesian equation. So I, I tend to write the parametric equations this way, so it looks more like a system. It's a little easier mentally, I think, to think about eliminating T and you know, plugging one equation into the other. So I usually will write them that way. The second equation, you could solve for T more easily than the first equation. If you're trying to use the substitution method, if one of the equations you can solve for T uniquely, that's the one you want to go with. This one, you're going to solve for T and get a plus or minus thing. That's not a good way to go. If one of the equations you can solve uniquely for T, that's what you should be doing. That's going to be the best possible output. So T here is going to equal Y divided by 4. And then we plug it into the upper equation, the first equation. So we're going to have uh, y squared divided by 16 plus 2. And that is a graph of it. When y is 0, x is going to be 2. That's going to put us right there. And that will be the graph of that parabola. You can plot some points, plot some Cartesian points. If we are up here, what's that y equals uh, 16 right there? So if you plug in 16 for y or negative 16 for y, you'll get that x is going to be equal to 18. So you can plot that and see that that's what the graph looks like. Okay, now they tell us that we're going to have this domain. So let's come over here and figure out these ordered pairs to figure out what part of the graph we're at. And the Cartesian graph will continue, right? It's going to continue. It's just a parabola. Maybe I should have continued this just to make sure that it's clear. The Cartesian graph continues. It's just a sideways parabola. But now we plug in our, our interval endpoints and a point in the middle for good measure. <coughs> Plug in t equals negative 4 right there. You get 16 plus 2, which is 18 for the x value. For the y value, you plug in negative 4 right there. You get negative 16. So here is the point that corresponds to t equals negative 4. Plug in 0, and we're going to get 2 comma negative 4. Plug in 0. Oh, no, I said that wrong. I, that's a semicolon. So plugging in 0, we get 2 comma 0. 2 comma 0. So right there, that's t equals 0. And then we're going to be up here for t equals positive 4. So t equals positive 4, plug it in, we get 18 comma 16. So there is our parametric curve right there. And we're going in this direction. That's the direction of increasing T. There is our parametric curve. None of this stuff in this chapter is especially hard. Um, which is great. It's nice to finish on a kind of easier chapter, uh, but you have to do enough of the problems to make sure you don't get sort of tangled up in the terminology in the process. All right, you all try this one. So eliminate T, graph it, and then apply the domain 0 to pi over 2 and pick three points because this is a closed curve. Picking three points is always a good thing. So see if you can pull that one together.
Let me know if you're snagging on any piece of it. <laughs> Using the Pythagorean theorem to eliminate T. <laughs> and plugging in your three your three T values. Cosine squared is one. When you isolate cosine, isn't three going to be in the denominator? Yeah, so it'll be in the denominator. Uh, not, a, not a coefficient. Doesn't matter which order, you can put the sine squared first or the cosine squared first. That doesn't matter. Um, so this is the equation you should be coming up with for your Cartesian equation. And because those denominators are equal, we would usually say, let's write it in this form. That would be the standard form of a circle of radius 3. Any questions up to that moment? No questions at this moment. <laughs> no questions. It's just a mess. There is our curve. Let's go ahead for our, our points. Again, we're going to pick the end points and then something in between. So 0, pi over 4, and pi over 2. That would be the natural choice. Plugging in zero. So first we plug it into our x coordinate and then we plug it into our y coordinate. So x equals zero, uh, t equals zero, cosine of zero is one, sine of zero is zero, so we're going to be at three zero. And looking at the layout, cosine is associated with x, sine is associated with y, so it should act like a regular unit circle, counterclockwise starting at the right point. That's, that's sort of all should gel together. So t equals 0 is there. <clears throat> pi over 4 in here. Cosine of pi over 4, cosine of pi over 4, root 2 over 2. Sine of pi over 4, root 2 over 2. So both of these should be 3 root 2 over 2s. 3 root 2 over 2, 3 root 2 over 2, that means it has to be on the line y equals x. So that is going to be pi over 4, so 3 root 2 divided by 3, or comma, 3 root 2 over 2. And then plugging in pi over 2, cosine of pi over 2 is 0, uh, sine of pi over 2 is 1, 1 times 3. 
And once again, we see that when we're dealing with the standard parametrization, which means cosine comma sine, we're going to go counterclockwise, and the T value is going to represent that angle, counterclockwise rotational angle. And notice that this coefficient in front represents the radius. radius. Right? That's representing the radius. So if we want a circle of radius 4, we would replace the 3s with a 4. Circle of radius 2, we'd replace the 3s with a 2. So that coefficient is going to be the radius of the circle. And our parametric curve is that, and the orientation is counterclockwise, so it looks like that. So that is our parametric curve. Question. Um, this is actually about the, uh, the parabolas. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that the orientation for this would be like clockwise? or? Like... Usually we don't use a word, we just use the picture. Okay. So with circles and ellipses, any closed curve we use clockwise or counterclockwise, but if it's a parabola or something, you sometimes could say left to right or right to left or top to bottom or bottom to top, but usually we just let the picture speak for itself okay. with the parabola. All right, try this one. So we've done enough examples so far that you should be able to do this one now. So the question, going backwards, is way harder than going forwards. If I give you the parametric equations, it's just kind of plug and chug to get to the, equa to get to the graph. But here they're saying, find the parametric equations for a circle centered at the origin. OK, that's good. We know how to do that. Radius 12, we know how to do that, with clockwise orientation and initial point 0, 12. So see if you can come up with those parametric equations. Look at the examples we did and see if you can piece together how we can start at the North Pole and go clockwise, not counterclockwise. score was 105%, low score was 25%, so 105 is the high, yeah, high, <laughs> super high. That's Oh, yeah. Hey, is anyone in here planning or wanting to take Cal 3 that's not registered yet? Is there anyone that's... So you want to get on the wait list immediately, because right now there's one person on the wait list, I think. Um, it should open up fine, but you want to get on right away. Yeah. Next semester. Next semester. <coughs> yeah. Did you register? Oh, I'm gonna take it next year. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Get registered if you're not. Most of you, I. Well, I'm I'm signed up for the. Uh, yeah, you're signed up. I saw you. Yeah, that's what you want. Um, what's the difference between that and the regular? The other one is only online. Oh, okay. And so originally, both the Cal 3s were all four credits. Mm -hmm. And then we extended the face to face Cal 3 to five credits so we just have more time in the class. But it's the same content. So if you do it online, um, you, know, you only have to pay for four credits, but it's online. <laughs> online Cal 3 for 99% of people I've met is a bad idea. I think I've only met one person in 20 something years that took it online and it was fine. But it was someone that was really, really just everything made sense. Yeah. So I would definitely recommend take it in the classroom. Not next semester, yeah. But I'll be in the math center a ton next semester and I love doing Calc 3. So come to the math center and we can do all sorts of Calc 3 next semester.
do teachers pick what classes they want to teach, or is it given to them by the school? Uh, yeah, we sort of rotate. We rotate. There's only a few of us that teach Cal 3 and Cal 2, so it's kind of... Just, right, right now, Charles and Gracie are kind of rotating through it. Excuse me. Question! There will be therapy dogs today at the library. Wait! What kind of dogs? Therapy dogs. Emotional support dogs. Aww. Dogs that help you really stress, anxiety. All right. And help this is a calculus class, so they're all stressed. <laughs> That's great. You guys want a poster? I'll, I'll, I'll pass it around. Let's pass it around, yeah. Petting dogs is a really great thing, unless you're allergic. <laughs> if you're not allergic, you should go to the library and... Um, and the meeting place, which is where the uh, old gaming room is. Oh, it's not in the library? <laughs> it is. It's in both. It's in the library and in the meeting place. Oh, 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 okay. And the meeting room is just uh, between the bookstore and the rotunda. Yeah. Where the ping pong tables used to be. Instead of ping pong tables, now we have dogs. Well, we're Tuesday. Today. Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, they used to be. yeah, we used to be able to play pong. Ping pong. Ping pong. <laughs> <laughs> Not pong. Not the original pong. <laughs> and not beer pong. <laughs> That's one thing. My kids are in college right now. They've gotten very good at beer pong. I'm like, not impressed. <laughs> Wait, that's what we're paying $38,000 a year for? And play beer pong? <clears throat> so today, in the game room, 11.30 to 12.30. Oh, right after class. We could go together and go pet the dogs. <laughs> okay, so we we know we're going to be using sine and cosine on this thing. So that's going to be the first piece, is that we know it's going to be sine and cosine. We know that if cosine comes first, we're starting on that side, on the right side, on the east side, and we're going counterclockwise. So that's definitely not what we want to do. <clears throat> so we're going to switch them and put sine first, cosine second. And then if the radius is going to be 12, put a 12 up front. And that's it. There's our orientation. So it wants a full circle. So we're going to say t is going to go from 0, and it's going to end at 2 pi. Now, typically, we would not want to include the 2 pi, because then you get a circle plus one extra point. So if we stop at 2 pi, if we don't include the 2 pi, then we're going to get exactly one circle. So let's confirm this. So if we're going to confirm this, we first are going to go with our standard Pythagorean equation. So anytime we're seeing trig functions, in order to eliminate t, we usually use the Pythagorean identity. Well, if we solve this one for sine, sine is going to be x divided by 12. So that's x divided by 12 quantity squared plus y divided by 12 quantity squared equals 1. And if we square it all out and multiply both sides uh, by 144, there is the standard equation of a circle of radius 12. That's what we wanted. And then if we want to check our start location and our orientation. We'll plug in our points. We're going to go, let's go 0 to 2 pi. And we have to be a little careful here. It's a closed curve, so we want three points. Um, but if we have our circle and 0 and 2 pi line up here to the same point, and pi is over here, that still doesn't tell us which way we went. <clears throat> so let's pick something other than pi. Let's pick pi over 2. Because 0 and 2 pi are going to line up to be the same point. So we need to be a little more careful. Okay, so plug it in 0. Sine of 0 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. 
So we start at 0, 12. <coughs> Plug in pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, so this is 12. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so 12 comma 0. All right, looks like we're going the right way. And then we plug in 2 pi, and we're back to the beginning. Sine of 2 pi is 0, and cosine of 2 pi is 1. So this tells us that we are going to, in fact, get a circle of radius 12 centered at the origin. And we are going to start up here. This is going to be t equals 0. This is going to be t equals pi over 2. And then this is also going to be t equals 2 pi. And we are, in fact, going this direction. God bless you. Um, is the 12 supposed to, for pi over 2, it's all positive? Oh, pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Oh. Yeah, because we want to go clockwise. Oh, we're wanting to go clockwise. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, wow, that took a chunk out of my circle. <laughs> yeah, let's take off those orientations, and we are going this way. Thank you. That's what it wanted us to do. And let's get this off of here. Can I take away just that point? Hmm. Well... Interesting. So there's t equals pi over 2. Yeah, so we're going clockwise. Clockwise, not counterclockwise. <laughs> Very exciting. Very visual. Very visual. All right, let's talk about lines, man. Mathematical lines. We are going to create them parametrically. And here is what lines will look like. At least, maybe I should say, the simplest way to represent a line will be that. There are some other kind of more complicated ways to create lines, but we want to just look at the simplest, most obvious type of equations for lines. So what we are going to see is that both x and y, both of, if we make both of these linear, so we do our x component linear and our y component linear, that'll create a line for us. And if you have had vectors before, you can think of, there is a vector approach to this. So if you've had some vectors before, here is the vector approach right here. This whole thing over here is the vector approach. So you could do it this way if you want. Um, if you're familiar with vectors, you can think of it that way. Uh, we'll do maybe a little of each. So the important thing is that this x naught y naught up here, that is going to correspond to sort of what I would refer to as the origin on the line. So x naught y naught, we think of it as the origin of this tilted line. It's the start point. <coughs> and then the slope of the line is going to be b divided by a. So the, the slope of the y equation divided by the slope of the x equation, so y over x, like we normally do for slope, y is over x, is x is in the bottom, that will be the slope of the line. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. So right here we've got these parametric equations, there and there. And what is x sub 0 in this case? 0. 0. So x sub 0 is the constant. It's the quote unquote intercept. You know, we used to call it the y-intercept in other contexts. But so 0 here, negative 4 there. So x naught and y naught. <coughs> so this ordered pair is going to act like the origin. And then A is the slope of the x equation, B is the slope of the y equation, <coughs> and the slope of our line is going to be B over A. Okay, so 
So the y slope over the x slope. So now we can graph it. Question? Go up a little bit. This way? Yeah, if you look a little more. More? So now we can graph it. So let's insert a graph. Let's see. No, I guess I want to insert a picture. Where is Oh, it's under draw, isn't it? Shapes. They call them shapes. <clears throat> okay. So all we're going to do is graph that line. We know how to do that. The, um, <clears throat> the y-intercept, <clears throat> well, it is the y-intercept, but it's going to act like the origin for this line. So 0, negative 4, so 1, 2, 3, 4, that's on the line. Slope is 3 halves, so all we do is what we normally do, up 3 over 2. There is our line. So that is how we graph a line. Find the, find the origin, find the slope, and graph it. Now, there's other ways with a parent. If you're given a line parametrically, as soon as you see that both of these are linear, you know for sure it's a line. You know for sure it's a line. You could just as easily say, hey, let's plug in t equals zero, let's plug in t equals two, and get two points. Right? So you don't have to build it this way. You could do it in another way. Lines are, you know, flexible. All right, let's take a look at this line. Oh, no, let's take a break. Let's take a break. <coughs> I've been enamored with the board not crashing. <laughs> take a pause, take a pause. <coughs> you steal this computer. Oh, gosh, it's not even overheating. So. All right, well, let's do another line. When we look at this one, once again, the easiest way to think about these is that each coordinate is a line all by itself. And so if we look at the X line and the Y line, the point that is going to be our origin point is the X naught, which is the constant from the X line, the Y constant, so that tells us that 6 comma negative 3 is a point on the line. That's going to act like the origin, 6 negative 3. <clears throat> and then A is the slope of the x equation, and B is the slope of the y equation, and the slope of our line is going to be B over A, so negative 3. <clears throat> Simple enough. And then we come over to our line, and 6, negative 3. It's right there. Slope is negative 3. So we could go down 3 and right 1, or we can go left 1 and up 3. Put us right there. Oh. So doing a full line is pretty easy. When we start to do segments, it's going to be a little bit trickier. And that's what we're going to do now. So with a full line, oh, I'm sorry. I just realized this is not a full line. This has an interval, t, negative 5 to 5. Oops, didn't notice that. Spacing that out. So let's figure out where we are then. So t, negative 5 to 5. Let's figure out exactly what our ordered pairs are. So if t is negative 5, the start point should be, if we plug in negative 5 there, 11. Plug in negative 5 there, negative 18. Okay, there it is right there. We'll just assume that's it. t equals negative 5. 
not to scale. And then if we plug in five, well, we could plug in zero too, just to see where we're at. Well, we already know where we're at, but we'll put it in the table as well, just to, just to have it there. So if we plug in t equals zero, we're at six negative three, which is gonna be our origin point. So that's t equals zero. <clears throat> and then t equals five looks like one comma 15 minus 312. We agree with that? So <laughs> 1 comma 12. Let's see, can I grab the line and extend it up to 1 comma 12? Seems to be working. So that's going to be 1 comma 12. Okay, and the orientation is going to be this way. That's the direction of increasing t. Make sense? Oh, there's Julian. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so now let's get to segments. So segments are a little harder when you have to create them. So let's go through the process. So when they give you the parameterization in the domain, it's not so hard because we can just plug in our endpoints. But here they tell us, we want to create the line segment that goes from 0, 0 over to uh, or up to 2, 8. So we're imagining this scenario. We're going to start at the origin, and we want to finish at 2, 8. So we're going to imagine this. Oh, they put an arrow there. Interesting. Wait, am I the one that got twenty-five percent? Do you want to be that person? No. Okay. I'll let you know later. Oh, here's mine. <laughs> Here, I'll get it for you. <laughs> yeah, you did not get twenty-five. There you go. <clears throat> okay, so that is the line segment we're trying to create. And so there's a couple of ways to do this. We need to figure out the A and the B. That's kind of the trickiest part. And if you look at the graph, the A and the B can be found by looking right here. That's going to be B and that's going to be A. Okay, so B is going to be the vertical rise in this case. <clears throat> so that's going to be 8 minus 0, which is 8. So that's the rise. <clears throat> and the run, A is going to equal 2 minus 0, which is 2. So that's going to be the slope. So B over A is going to be the slope of 4. So B is going to be 8. A is going to be 2. And x naught and y naught, what do you think those are going to be? X naught, y naught will be zeros. zeros. So x naught, y naught is always where we start for a line segment. So that's going to be zero and zero. So this tells us that our parameterization. And maybe this is a good time to talk about the fact that parameterizations are not unique. <clears throat> so this parameterization, what do you think the interval will be for t? So clearly we start at 0. Where do we end? 1, right? At 1 will be at 2, 8. Won't this parameterization give us the same line if I do this? What if I do t comma 4t? <coughs> Excuse me, if we start at 0, we're at the origin. And if we go to 2 instead of 1, aren't we at 2 comma 8? Won't that create the same line? Yeah? So parameterizations are not unique. Quite frequently, it's beneficial to have this domain be 0 to 1. 
There's a lot of contexts where you want the domain to be zero to one. So usually we'll leave the slope here with the A and the B so that we just have an interval zero to one, but you don't have to. Can somebody give me another parameterization that would be the same exact line? Say again? Um, four t, uh, x equals 4t and y equals 16t. Yeah, exactly. So that will also do it. And here t will start at 0. And then what will t be at the end? One half. One half, exactly. So you can always line up, you can always create a domain that you want based on how you choose your slope. Yeah. All of those will give you the same exact curve. <clears throat> All right, so here's another one. So let's see. So here we're going to start at negative 1, negative 3. And we're going to end at 6, comma, negative 16. 6, negative 16. We'll just assume that that's down there at negative 16. So we'll go like that. So that's the line segment we're trying to create. We want the graph for that parameterization. So we're starting at negative 1, negative 3. So that's where we're starting, and we're going this direction. So then we want to figure out the rise and the run. <clears throat> what is the rise going to be? Those are the change in the y values. So this is going to be negative 16 minus 3. So we're going to take the change in the y's, starting at the end point, and then subtracting off the start point. Say that again? Uh, minus negative 3, yes. Yes, minus negative 3, so it's going to end up being negative 13. Yes, thank you. So negative 16 minus minus 3. And then this direction, the x direction, is going to be 6 minus minus 1. So that will be 7. So now we can fill in the blanks. x naught and y naught are always right where you start. So that's the origin of the line or the line segment. It's the start point. And then A and B. So B is vertical. A is horizontal. So it's going to be 7 and negative 13. And if you look at the slope of this line, negative 13, positive 7. So that's what we get. B over A, negative 13 over 7. So our parametric equations are then, or at least the natural parametric equations, are going to be x equals negative 1 plus 7 times t, and y will equal negative 3 minus 13 times t, and t will go between 0 and 1. So if we plug in t equals 0, we get our start point, t equals 0. And if we plug in t equals 1, we're going to get 6 comma negative 16. We'll get the end point. So that is how line segments work. Again, nothing super complicated, but definitely want to do enough of them that you sort of understand where everything goes. <clears throat> Let's do some calculus on these new objects, these parametric curves. Well, taking derivatives could not be easier. All we have to do to find dy dx, so dy dx means what it always does, the slope of the tangent line means the same thing as it meant in Calc 1, same thing as it meant earlier this semester. All we do is take the derivative of the second one over the derivative of the first one. 
So dy dt over dx dt. That's all we have to do. So when we come in here and it says what is dy dx, this is going to be that, that derivative over that derivative. So we're going to take the derivative of this and get 8 cosine of t minus sine of t in the denominator. So it's going to be the y derivative over the x derivative. And that's it. Now the thing that's weird <coughs> is the expression on Daniel's face. <laughs> the thing that's weird is that this derivative normally, when you see dy dx, you think function of x. But the derivative now is a function of t. So we just have to be a little careful. If they say find the derivative at x equals 4, <laughs> you need to do a little work to figure out what's the t value when x is equal to 4. So the derivative right now is a function of t. <clears throat> and if we wanted to, we could write this, if we wanted to combine, we, you know, you could write this as negative 8 cotangent of t, if you want. Okay. Now they tell us, they didn't give us an x value for the derivative, they say, okay, find the derivative at pi over 2. So here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> so the way we represent this is to draw this vertical line like that. Because we don't want to say dy dx of pi over 2 because that one would imply that it was an x value. So we use a slight, we use more of the, you know, sort of the in the integral kind of notation with the vertical bar and the t down there. And so all we have to do is plug in pi over 2. And what is cotangent of pi over 2? So if you want, if it's easier for you to look up here, cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, so 0 over 1, which is 0. Okay, so that means what it always has meant, horizontal tangent. If the derivative is zero, that means the slope of the tangent is zero, it means there's a horizontal tangent line. Okay, well let's see if that makes sense. All right, like right now we, don't, we haven't even talked about what this object is. Let's go ahead and come over here and let's figure out what this curve is. We know that it's a curve in two-dimensional space, because we have two coordinate functions and one parameter. So that means it's a curve in R2, in two space. Well, anytime we have a parametric curve and we have trig functions, we want to eliminate the t with the Pythagorean theorem. Sine of t is y squared over 64. Cosine squared is just x squared equals 1. And what is that the equation of? That is a? Close, not quite a circle. If the, de the denominators would have to be the same for it to be a circle. So what is it? It's an ellipse. If the denominators are different, then it's an ellipse. So if we want to graph this ellipse, we are going to... First, identify the center of this ellipse. And what is the center of this ellipse? 0, 0. Center is the origin, right? Because it's x squared and y squared. It's not x minus 2 and y plus 3. It's x squared and y squared. So the origin is the center. So we're, we're, still, we're sort of thinking of this right here as our center. We look under the y's to figure out how far to go up and down. So the square root of 64 is 8, so we're going to go up to 8 and down to negative 8. So those are going to be on the major axis. And then on the minor axis, under the x's is a 1, so we're just going to go left and right 1. And that will be our ellipse. Okay. And now, in terms of orientation, they're not asking us about orientation, but let's just talk about it for a moment. In order to do the orientation, we would want to look at 
several ordered pairs just to see which way we're going. Let's plug in zero, pi over two, and pi. That should be plenty. If we plug in zero, cosine of zero is one. Uh, sine of zero is zero, so we're at one zero. So it's kind of, we, we're gonna get what we expect because it's cosine and then sine. Plugging in pi over two, cosine of pi over two is zero, sine of pi over two is one, so we're at zero comma eight. And then when we plug in pi, cosine of pi is negative one, sine of pi is zero. So we are in fact going to get what we think. Counterclockwise, there's t equals zero. And the t value is corresponding to the counterclockwise angle. So we are going that direction. So that, there's our curve, that's our parametric curve. So now we found the derivative at pi over two to be zero. So if we wanna know where we are on the curve, we now look for where t is pi over two. There it is. So let me just move these a little bit. So we have our horizontal tangent line right here at t being pi over two. So there's the horizontal tangent with slope of zero. Make sense? So let's look at one that's not a trig function. So we've got this parametric curve here. I'm gonna stack it. it. It feels easier to manipulate when things are stacked. So there is our parametric curve. We want to find the slope of the tangent when t is negative one. So we wanna do what we normally do. We wanna find dy dx. <coughs> so dy dx, we take the derivative of y, take the derivative of x. That's it, there's dy dx. y prime over x prime. And then we want to evaluate, evaluate it at negative one, but it's not x equals negative one, so we don't want to put of negative one. We put that evaluation bar, plug in negative one and we get three halves. So that says the slope of the tangent is 3 divided by 2, it's 3 halves, when t is negative 1. All right, well, that seems kind of abstract and meaningless unless we have a graph. So let's go ahead and figure out what this looks like. So we've got our graph. Let's see. I won't do that. So... To graph this, what's our process? Eliminate t, graph the Cartesian curve, and then see if there's any restrictions that would give us just part of the Cartesian curve. So let's go ahead and do that. So it's very easy to solve for t up with the first equation. So t is gonna be x divided by two. <clears throat> Plug that into the lower equation. And we're going to have y equals x cubed divided by 8. So this is our Cartesian, our Cartesian curve right there. So we know what x cubed divided by 8 looks like. x cubed is the cubic, the standard cubic. It's divided by 8, so we're going to have, it's going to be squashed a little bit. Let's just draw it, kind of sketch it, <clears throat> roughly like that. So it's the cubic divided by eight. So it's, oh, I drew it steeper. Shouldn't it be shallower? Yeah, I should, because we're dividing by eight, we should be flattening it out a little bit, not steepening it up. So we'll call it that. So that's y equals x cubed over eight. Okay, so t equals negative one. Where are we when t is negative one? Well, when t is negative one, the ordered pair that it corresponds to is negative two comma negative one. 
So negative 2, negative 1, right here. That's going to be our point. And then we draw our tangent line, and the tangent line is going to have slope 3 halves. So it's going to look something like that, and the slope of that will be 3 divided by 2. <clears throat> Make sense? I suppose. I suppose it makes sense. I suppose it makes sense. <clears throat> okay, let's try another. So find the equation of the tangent line. Okay, now we didn't do we didn't go this far in the last one. We didn't actually find the equation of the tangent line. So this one we're gonna go a little further find the actual equation of the tangent line. Finding the equation of a line should be, you know, review. So dy dx, derivative of y, we get 3t squared plus 1. Derivative of x is 2t. And then dy dx, t equals 2, we're going to take our derivative, plug in 2 for t, so we get 4, we have 13 fourths, okay, so that is the slope of the tangent when t is 2, now we need to know where are we when t is 2, well the place that we're at is x and y when t is 2, when we plug in t equals 2 we get 4 minus 1, which is 3. So this point right here, this is our point of tangency. Plug in the 2 right here is 8 plus 2, which is 10. So 3 comma 10 is the point on the curve where the slope is 13 fourths. So our tangent line is up here, right there. And it has a slope of 13 divided by 4. That'll be the slope. Now we have what it takes to make the equation of the tangent line. We use the point-slope formula. So we're going to do y minus 10 equals the slope, which is 13 divided by 4, times x minus 3. That'll generate our equation. Point-slope formula. <clears throat> So if we solve for y, y will be 13 over 4 times x minus 39 over 4, distributing the 13 fourths. And then we're going to add 10, but we're going to add 10 with a denominator of 4, so we'll add it as 40 fourths. So our equation for the tangent line will be that. <clears throat> so there's the equation of the tangent line. <coughs> Any piece of that you have questions about? So standard old point slope formula. Any issues? All good? Where does t equals 2 come from? Given. Oh. So that's given. So they want the slope of the tangent line at 2. They want the equation of the tangent line at 2. So you just take the derivatives of the t's, um, divide them, plug in your given to get the slope and plug in the given into the original parametric curve to get the location, to get the x, y. <clears throat> plug in the given to the Oh, yeah. So plug in 2 to the equation, plug in 2 to the derivative, and then build our point slope. Yeah, I suppose that makes sense. I suppose it makes sense. OK. Arc length. Arc length. We have done arc length already. 
But this arc length is a little different. <coughs> but the equation is not too bad. That's the equation right there. So we remember back when we did arc length originally, when we had a function the way that we did arc length. So this is a reminder, we did something like one plus y prime squared dx. So we had that kind of same setup where there was a square root and a derivative squared. But now that we're dealing with parametric curves, we have to have both the x derivative and the y derivative. <clears throat> so that's going to be our new integrand. We have to take the derivative of each. Now why they choose... So math books love to make things more complicated. <clears throat> we do not need to have an f and a g. We already have an x and a y. We don't need to rename them f and g. You can if you want, but it's just easier to think of it this way. It's x prime squared plus y prime squared. We don't need to introduce new letters. If you want, you can, but we can just use the x and the y. There's no reason to introduce new letters. So we take the derivative, square them, take the square root. <clears throat> and this is kind of the same thing that we did back in arc length with functions. You know, you're integrating ds to get s. s is the arc length, but we don't know anything about s. So we have to change the ds to something with a differential that we know information about. So we switched it to a dx or a dy back a couple months ago. Now we're going to switch it to a dt. <coughs> so let's go ahead and try an arc length. So we've got this line, and I know it's a line because the x and the y are both linear. If the x and the y are both linear, you know the graph's going to be a line. But it is possible to create lines with things that are not linear. We're not going to do that, but it's possible. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's go ahead and find the arc length on this interval 0 to 2. So the arc length will be the integral from 0 to 2. And then we do the square root of the sum of the squares of the derivatives. So 3 <coughs> squared plus 4 squared dt. That'll be our point. Take the derivatives, square them, add them, take the square root. So this is the square root of 25, which is 5. And that's going to be 5 times 2, which is 10. There is the arc length. <clears throat> so remember that when you're integrating a constant, the constant factors out, and then the integral of a con the integral of just dt, that's just the length of the interval. If you integrate dt, the integral of that, if you really went through all the nuts and bolts, the integral would be t from 0 to 2, which would be 2 minus 0, which is 2. You always get the length of the interval when you integrate a differential. <coughs> so there is our uh, arc length. So we integrate the square root of the derivatives. Let's try another one. Okay, so <coughs> this is a shifted circle. So the center is 0, 1. So it's shifted up. We're going to look at the full circle, so 0 to 2 pi. When you're integrating, it doesn't matter if you include or exclude that endpoint. Technically, if you include this 2 pi, we really have a circle plus an extra point. But that's not going to add any extra arc length. So it doesn't really matter. So first thing we're going to do is integrate 0 to 2 pi. This will be arc length. Wait, you're finding the arc length of that? I am, yeah. Yes, yes, there are other ways. But, it, but just... There are other ways. Just like we're going to use calculus. There are other ways, but we're going to use calculus. <laughs> <laughs> so there is certainly a, a, a simpler way, but we want to figure out these formulas. So we have to take the derivative of x 
So the derivative of x is going to be, let's see, minus 3 sine of t. And the derivative of y is going to be 3 cosine of t. So in our formula here, we do x prime squared. So that's going to be 9 sine squared of t, 9 cosine squared of t, and then a dt. Any part of that giving you a hang up? Well, yes. No, not you. How do you actually evaluate that um, integral? It has a square root and it has some squares in it and all All the business? How do you actually integrate that, you know, the old fashioned way? Like that. Factor out the 9 and then sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Everybody agree with that? Right, you have 9 times sine squared plus cosine squared. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Square root of 9 is 3. And then once again, we have the integral of a differential, which equates to the length of the interval. So we have 2 pi times 3, which is 6 pi. Which is 2 pi. Oh. Which, if you use circumference formula, 2 pi r, you would get the same thing. Yeah. Will it ever be on the test where you ask obvious questions like that, but then expect me to solve them the hard way? And if I just write, I would never do that the to you. Easy way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's look at this one. So this curve is a little less obvious. You think it's a circle? Well, it sure looks like a circle. Right. So. If we wanted to know what that curve was, we would have to eliminate t and graph the Cartesian and then you know, do what we've been doing. Um, certainly looks like a circle. I'd like you to sh prove it to me, though, Julian. But how come some of those um, segments of the circle are missing? So that's because we have a domain from 0 to pi. So 0 to pi is going to pull off half of whatever the object is, circle or maybe it's an ellipse. <coughs> then why is it 1 half that's, that's dashed and not Because 2 pi would take us all the way around the object. 1 pi takes us halfway around when the angle is t. If the angle were something like 2t, then it would be a little different. But if the angle is t, 0 to pi takes us halfway around, 0 to 2 pi takes us all the way around. So the derivative of x is going to be minus sine of t minus cosine of t. And then y prime is going to be minus sine of t plus cosine of t. So there is the pair of derivatives. And then we can form, what was the question? Oh, arc length. <laughs> then, like, somebody distracted me. The... Uh, arc length is then the square root of the sum of the squares. So we're going to have L equals integral from, they told us the domain, 0 to pi. So we want the integral from 0 to pi, square root x prime squared plus y prime squared. I'll bet there's going to have a bunch of junk that's going to cancel out. <laughs> I bet you're right. <laughs> A bunch of junk is going to cancel. So x prime squared, we have to square this thing. So we're going to get sine squared of t. That's that one. And we'd have a cosine squared. Let's do the middle term first. So the middle term is this times this times 2. So sine cosine times 2. So plus 2 sine cosine. Now here's a place where it, because all the angles are just t, if I was doing this on, the, on a piece of paper, I would probably just use s squared and 2sc and c squared. It'd be a little bit less tedious to write it all out. But. Plus, oh yeah, already we can cancel the sine squared and cosine squared into a 1. So then, yeah, that will reduce to a 1. And then down here when we square the y's, we're also going to get sine squared. 
we're going to get minus 2 sine sine t cosine t plus cosine squared of t dt. Oh, so it looks like everything there except for a cosine squared. So these wipe out, right? Wait. Wait, so you get the all of it cancels into right. one. Yeah, so you get the square root of two. Square root of two. Eight. So we get zero to pi, square root of two, dt. So this is going to be root two times pi. Oh, wow. Two, a doubly irrational number. Doubly irrational? Yeah. Is that like being really pregnant? <laughs> Doubly irrational. <laughs> you are irrational or not, right? You're either pregnant or you're not. <laughs> What's an irrational times an irrational? Um, an irrational. I'm assuming another. Um, um, but might be irrational. If you, if you right? Uh, so, the square two is irrational, and it times itself is two, which is rational, but... <laughs> so there is no rule, right? If you have an irrational times an irrational, usually it's still going to be irrational. Like, if you take irrational times irrational, and there's not some special case like root two times root two, then it's going to stay irrational. My favorite identity is there's a mathematical constant called phi. Um, it's about 1.61803 something. And phi squared is equal to 1 plus phi. Phi squared is 1 plus phi. What is phi equal? About 1.618. Is that golden ratio? Golden ratio. Golden ratio? Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Golden ratio. Okay, so this is yet... So if this was a circle, is that what half the circumference would be? No. So this, if this is a circle, it looks like it'd be a circle of radius 2. So the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, so 4 pi for the full circle divided by 2 would be 2 pi. So that tells us it's definitely... No, not because it's a, circle. a square root. Looks can be deceiving. You know what? It's a it's it's half of the it's circumference of the square root of a circle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> Whatever that means. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Let's go to polar coordinates. So we have two sections left, and then and then cal two's over. So second to last section, polar coordinates. So this is a slightly different perspective. <clears throat> there are some curves that are so hard to graph Cartesianally that we go to another coordinate system called polar coordinates. Super important to be able to convert to new coordinate systems. In Calc 3, you are going to do Cartesian, cylindrical, and spherical. Those are three different coordinate systems that you can use depending on the shapes that you're dealing with. The coordinate system is usually best picked based on the objects that you're dealing with. Like if you're dealing with cylinders, <clears throat> the cylindrical coordinate system makes a lot of sense. If you're dealing with spherical stuff, the spherical coordinate system makes a lot of sense. So there's going to be cases where you cannot do it in Cartesian easily. So you want to use another coordinate system. So let's talk about this first other coordinate system that we're going to introduce called the polar coordinate system. <clears throat> so the polar variables are r and theta, and you're already familiar with them. r is like the hypotenuse of a right triangle in quadrant one, theta is the counterclockwise angle. All right. So you're already familiar with that. So those are the two polar variables, r and theta. The first thing we usually look at in a coordinate system is what do the coordinate variables equal to a constant look like? Like in x and y, if you graph x equals a constant, you get a vertical line. 
If you graph y equals a constant, you get a horizontal line. So what we want to do here is let's understand what do we get if we graph r equals 3. A circle. We are going to get a circle of radius 3. So in our polar coordinate system, the points are r comma theta. So if you are given this equation, this says graph all polar points with an r value of 3. And there's no theta in the equation, so theta can be anything from 0 to 2 pi. So if you think that way, like if you graph x equals 1 in two-dimensional space, you want all the points with an x value of 1. The y value is not in the equation, so there's no restriction on y, so y can be anything, so you get the vertical line. Same idea here. R is the only variable in the equation, so that means the other variable is unlimited. It can be anything. And so this is going to, in fact, give you a circle of radius 3 centered at the origin. So that'll be right at the origin. <clears throat> okay, let's think about theta equals a constant. So if theta is a constant, theta is an angle, let's just pick pi over 6. So if theta is pi over 6, what is the graph of that polar equation? Well, it's all the polar points where theta is pi over 6. So we're going to end up with a diagonal line. So if we take the coordinate system, so right there, and then theta is pi over 6, that is going to create this diagonal line right there where that angle is pi over 6. So, so we are going to get a full line. So okay. it's like instead of an x and y, you have an r and a theta. R and a theta. And you have functions that are um, in, in terms of theta or in terms of r. Yeah, so usually we write r as a function of theta, which is also a little funny because we do r comma theta. When we do x comma y, don't we do the second one as a function of the first one? Right? We do y as a function of x. Polar is backwards. They do r as a function of theta. Which, why they don't do theta comma r to parallel the y equals f of x? I don't, I don't quite know why they did that. Now here, notice this. So we are in fact going to get this whole entire line. So if we are looking at, say, this point right here, that point would be 2 comma pi over 6. So the question that I want you to think about for a moment are these points over here. If theta is pi over 6, what do these r values have to be? They have to be negative. So polar is the one place where we're going to allow negative r values, negative radial distances. So for example, this point right here is going to be negative 2 comma pi over 6. So we still have this angle of pi over 6, but if the radial value is negative, it means that you jump 180 degrees into the opposite quadrant. So that's how we're going to get this entire line. And the reason that we allow negative r values is so that we can get the entire line with um, theta equals a constant. <clears throat> okay, so another equation up here that you'll see is this, um, or, or another feature that you'll see up here is obviously the, um, what is it called, the periodic nature of polar. So if you add 2 pi to theta, you're going to end up back at the same point. So polar, represent polar representation of points is not unique because you can rotate around the, the pole. In polar, we usually call the origin the pole. So you can rotate around the pole multiple times. So you can add 2 pi and end up at the same place. <clears throat> so then here is where they're talking about the negative r values right here. If you go opposite direction of the quadrant that theta lives in, then you have a negative r value. OK. So it's like instead of graphing the things on a plane, it's like you're looking down onto the North Pole and then Graphing things in terms of their latitude and longitude. Yeah, that's, you can think of it that way. Um, yeah, yeah, you can think of it that way. So 
these are the equations that we are going to use to go back and forth between the two systems. Okay, And they should be pretty obvious if we look at this right triangle. So we've got four variables here. We have our x, y, and then we have our r and our theta. And pretty obvious that x squared plus y squared is r squared. Pretty obvious that tangent of theta is y over x. A tan y over And then these hopefully are obvious. If you find cosine of theta, cosine of theta is x over r. And if you multiply both sides by r, you get that x is equal to r cosine theta. And similarly, if you look at sine of theta, sine of theta is y over r. So that tells us that y is r sine theta. So maybe not as obvious as these two, but a little bit of algebra in you, or a little bit of trig in you get to them. So those are the equations that allow us to go back and forth between polar and Cartesian. Those are the gatekeeper formulas. So let's first make sure that we understand this whole uh, representation of points in polar. Somebody pick one of the points up there, and let's talk about that point. Pi over four. That's not the point. That's not B. a point. One of the letters. B. One of the B. Did I hear B? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so there's B right there. Let's represent B in four ways. So we could represent B, so we do R comma theta. The standard representation of B would be, what do you think? R, what do you think R would be, the standard R? Um, three. three and pi over four. That would be our standard representation. Whenever possible, that's the representation we use, a positive R value and a theta value that puts you into the quadrant that you're in. But, for all the contrarians out there, you can do things differently. Like, Let's make like the R value negative. Minus yeah. 3 and then pi over So I want negative 3 and I want a positive angle. What's your positive angle going to be? Say again? I think I heard it. Five pi over four. So right to there. So if we go here, that's five pi over four. With an R value of negative, that would jump us back into quadrant one. So we need five pi over four in the opposite quadrant. So this would be the same. This would be another representation of the same point. Now let's go with negative, but also a negative angle. Negative 3 pi over 4. So we could come this direction right there to that. That's going to be negative 3 pi over 4. So now we have a negative angle, but we want to jump to quadrant 1, so we also have a negative r value. So now we have both being negative for the hypercontrarians. And now let's make the radial value positive, but the theta value negative. So R being positive 3, if we're going to use a positive 3, that means we need an angle that ends in quadrant 1, but if we want it to be negative, we're going to go this direction. So we're going to start there and go all the way around to there. So that's negative 7 pi over 4. Right, this is pi over 4 there, so that's got to be 7 pi over 4 because there's 8 pi over 4 total. So negative 7 pi over 4. So those are all representations of the exact same point. So polar representations are far from unique. <clears throat> but this, whenever possible, this is the one we like. That is our standard representation. So standard representation, positive r, positive theta, and theta is between 0 and 2 pi. Because you could also... You know, if you wanted to be whatever it's called, you could also add 2 pi to that, where you'd have a positive and a positive. So if you added uh, 2 pi to that, you'd get 9 pi over 4. So that's also the same point. But usually what we would like is positive r, positive theta, theta between 0 and 2 pi. So, so to make it simple, you want to sort of take the Euclidean modulus of the 
that, and then if needed, correct the other one to make it positive. Mm -hmm. By modulus, I mean like, you know, the hour hands are always between um, 0 and 59 or something. Yeah. Yeah. Do that. Do that. Okay, so here we have some polar points. It is not necessarily obvious when you're given a pair of coordinates that they're polar. So here they're telling us. Sometimes, just to be clearer, folks will put like a P here, just to emphasize that it's not Cartesian. I mean, it kind of jumps out at us that it's probably polar because we see these things that look like angles, but angles are really just numbers, so it's not totally obvious. So here they're telling us that they are in polar. Now we want to convert to Cartesian. So a couple of things. First off, remember that it's R comma theta for these, and if we were to plot them, we would go one unit from the origin, and then at 2 pi over 3. So 2 pi over 3, 1 pi over 3, 2 pi over 3, one unit from the origin, so that is the first point right there. That's that point. <coughs> this point, we go to 3 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4 is right here, but then we go negative 4, so 3 pi over 4 and negative 4 is going to put us right there. So that is the second point. Okay, now it's asking for the Cartesian coordinates of those polar points. And this is actually a pretty easy direction to go, because we have these two equations. X is R cosine theta, and Y is R sine theta. And so we can find x and y directly if we know r and we know theta, all we have to do is substitute those in and simplify. So that's not too bad. <clears throat> so for this one right here, for the first one, we're going to have x equals r is 1 times cosine of 2 pi over 3. And y is going to be 1 times sine of 2 pi over 3. Cosine of 2 pi over 3 is like... Cosine of 2 pi over 3 is negative 1 half. Sine of 2 pi over 3, root 3 over 2. So in Cartesian, we would be at negative 1 half comma root 3 divided by 2. And I'll put a little C there just to emphasize that's Cartesian. Marty? So this is kind of similar to vectors, right? Like R would be the magnitude of the vector. And Theta would be the angle in radians of like the angle compared to the axis. And like the x and y, the Cartesian, would be like the vector components, basically. Exactly. Oh. That's exactly right. So the the r value, the magnitude of the vector, so we're gonna see that, yeah, you'll see that really soon. Like this is on the unit circle, so the magnitude is one. And if you're not on the unit circle, you'll see a coefficient out in front that gets multiplied. If you were in vector form, it would multiply to both of them. So that's exactly right. Oh. Uh, okay. All right, so let's look at this one. So the second one here, we're going to have x, x equals r cosine theta. So x is going to be r, which is negative 4, times cosine of 3 pi fourths. And y is going to be negative 4 sine of 3 pi over 4. And if you look at these, cosine and sine, that's going to be a point on the unit circle, and then the r scales it off the unit circle. So the cosine sine is always going to be on the unit circle, so this will be negative 4, negative 4. Cosine of 3 pi over 4 is negative root 2 over 2. And this one's positive. So it's going to be 2 root 2, and that's minus 2 root 2. So this point here in Cartesian is 2 root 2, negative 2 root 2. And I'll put a C there just to emphasize that's Cartesian. And that makes sense. We're in quadrant 4. And so if you look, if you... 
kind of take what Mari just said, if you look right there, that distance right there is going to be two, is going to be uh, four. So if you took your unit circle value of negative root two over two, positive root two over two, and you multiplied it by four, it's going to plop you down there. All right, any questions on that? <laughs> so going, going the other direction is harder. Going the other direction is harder. <clears throat> and there's a couple of ways to do it. You could do it very geometrically by looking at a scaled unit circle value or you can just do it purely blindly mathematically. It does not matter. So these are both in Cartesian, and we want to go over to polar. So the equations that we're going to be looking at, we want the polar things. So we have x squared plus y squared equals r squared. That has the polar r isolated on the right. We also have the y over x is tangent of theta. And we could take the inverse tangent to isolate theta. So those are the two that give us r and theta. So let's look at this. So first, we'll do x squared plus y squared. So 1 squared plus root 3 squared equals r squared. So we're going to get 1 plus 3 is equal to r squared. So r will be plus or minus 2. The natural choice would be to pick the positive r value. But you could pick the negative r value if you wanted to. So there's your r. Pick it to be positive 2. So I'm going to choose r to be positive 2. Now we need our theta value. So we're imagining this circle of radius 2 centered at the origin. Now we want to figure out, OK, what's the, pos what's the angle? Now. We have to be a little careful because what is the range of inverse tangent? Negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So inverse tangent cannot find an angle that's in quadrants 2 or 3. So we have to be a little careful. When we look up here, this is in quadrant 1. That's in quadrant one, so it's not going to matter. We can just do inverse tangent, and it's going to give us the right angle. But if we're not in quadrant one, we have to be a little more careful. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to do tangent of theta is equal to root three, and then tangent inverse of root three is going to be pi over three. So that is the angle. So therefore, our polar representation is 2 comma pi over 3. That will be our polar representation for the first one. <coughs> well, let's take a look at the second one more visually. 0, negative 9. 0, negative 9 is on the vertical axis. We are down here at negative 9. What's the r value? 9. 9. So if we go with positive r values, this distance here is 9. So we can choose r equals 9. And what's the angle? Um, Three, three pi over two? Three pi over two. Yeah, there we have it. So visually, you can do a lot of these. So this in polar will be 9 comma, excuse me, I said in polar. This in Cartesian will be, um, no, no, in polar, in polar. This in polar is going to be pretty easy to just do visually. You know, you're at 0, negative 9 Cartesian coordinates. Figure out your theta, figure out your r. Now, I want to do one more perspective on number 33. 
So one comma root three. Isn't it true if we look at what is the point on the unit circle that this most closely looks like? Can you multiply it by something or divide it by something so that it's on the unit circle? Divide by two. Divide by two. So if we look at a unit circle and we look at this point right here on the unit circle, that point is one half comma root three over two. Everyone agree with that? And so this has a radius of one right there. So if we multiply this point by two, we are going to be out here. If we multiply that by two, we are going to be at one comma root three. So you can kind of say, oh, this angle to here is pi over three, but then this radial distance right here is two. And that's what we're doing here. So if we take this radial distance of two and multiply it by that point, we're gonna get one comma root three. So you can always sort of look at the unit circle and figure out what your scaling factor is. is a, or you can just do you know, the formulas and plug them in and go. Either one. Okay, let's stop. I will see you all on Thursday. Final a week from Thursday. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Final in a week. <laughs>